This is a paper with my co-author Jennifer Candapan, a graduate student in sociology. Um, we're preparing this paper for a special issue of the journal Urban Studies that's focused on the intersection between schools and neighborhoods, both in the US and uh, in international contexts. So if that's a research area of yours, definitely be on the lookout for that special issue. And as Gary mentioned, you know, one sort of uh, area of research that the Soul Price Center for Social Innovation focuses on is this idea of pathways to opportunity. And so this paper is really in line with that effort to sort of promote and support research that documents the extent of these sort of long-standing entrenched social problems in, uh, especially in urban areas, this is about metropolitan areas as well, um, that we probably need social innovation to address because we've been facing these problems for a really long time and maybe we need something new to kind of move the lever on them. So there's a large literature on the relationship between neighborhood socioeconomic status and children's educational, occupational, health, uh, and other outcomes later in life. At this point, I am well and good convinced that growing up in a low SES neighborhood reduces children's future life chances, and I have nearly a century of, despite what some scholars may argue, I think I have nearly a century of research kind of backing me up across methods and spaces on this point. So I think we know at this point, or, or many of us are convinced that neighborhoods matter. I think we have less empirical evidence demonstrating why or how neighborhoods matter um, for children's outcomes. So generally, we kind of have two classes of mechanisms proposed, right? We have this kind of big bucket of neighborhood institutions. Um, and then we have this other bucket of neighborhood social processes, things like collective efficacy, social um, organization, um, role modeling, other things we've paid attention to in sociology and in other disciplines. So in this paper, Jen and I are focusing on this link between neighborhood SES and one uh, neighborhood institution that we think might be particularly important for children, the local schools. So a small body of literature has tried to kind of disentangle the contribution of both school and neighborhood characteristics um, for children's outcomes. And there is some methodological challenges to this. Um, there's you know, sort of similarities between neighborhoods and schools that make it kind of hard to figure out what's contributing to what. There's selection into both contexts. And so at this point, the literature is actually fairly split, you know, in this kind of horse race between do neighborhoods and schools matter more, there's kind of evidence on both sides. So we thought it might be productive to take a different approach and just to kind of step back uh, and, and think more richly and descriptively about what this relationship really is between neighborhoods and schools. So rather than trying to kind of sort out whether neighborhood effects operate through schools or, or sort of how much the neighborhood effect can be mediated by schools or which one matters more, we set out to simply describe the inequalities in the schools serving neighborhoods of varying levels of socioeconomic status. And I think this is something that we make a lot of assumptions about, both as scholars and in sort of our popular conversations, you know, this assumption of, oh, you know, disadvantaged neighborhoods are, are served by, you know, schools of this particular type, but we actually don't have a whole lot of good empirical evidence on this, um, especially kind of at the um, national level or across metropolitan areas. So just to present uh, a little bit of context for our study, um, we can step back for a minute and think about economic inequality between neighborhoods and sort of what children are facing. So we hear a lot about growing economic inequality and polarization in the public conversation. I think the narrative has sort of been, you know, we have kind of growing spatial inequality. Um, and research that I've done demonstrates that actually, if you look at income segregation among all households, which is this black dashed line here, uh, going back to 1970, it really hasn't changed that much. So the degree to which households are sorting across neighborhoods on the basis of income really hasn't changed that much, despite, you know, just this week there was a, an article in City Lab claiming uh, the opposite. So I emailed Richard Florida and was like, nope. But where there is, where there has been some action and where there has been substantial change is among families with children. So that's what this, I guess it's supposed to be blue, I don't know what color you see, this blue line uh, is demonstrating. So income segregation has grown substantially by about 20% among families with children um, since, the since 1990. So there's sort of increasing sorting by income among families with kids uh, across neighborhoods. 
So today, children live in more economically homogenous, either sort of predominantly rich or predominantly poor neighborhoods than they did uh, 20 years ago. And you'll also see that this line is sort of the highest on this segregation index. So families with kids are kind of the most segregated. They're more segregated than families uh, or households without children who are kind of down here. So there's some sort of unique levels of neighborhood inequality that kids are facing. Uh, so it's important to think about, you know, what are the resources available in their neighborhoods that might account for uh, the neighborhood effects we see later in life. Okay, so when you're thinking about how to classify and characterize schools, um, there's lots of different things you could think about. So in this paper, we're focusing on kind of five classes of either school inputs and outputs uh, that past research indicates affect children's outcomes. So I think, you know, since the Coleman Report uh, over 50 years ago, scholars have demonstrated that who a child attends school with shapes his or her achievement, either because of parent resources or sort of the type of resor other resources, either teachers or money or other things that schools can sort of attract based on who attends them. So we examine racial, ethnic, poverty, and ability composition of schools. Um, second, there's you know, some evidence that sort of school climate matters. Uh, we're a little bit limited in how we measure that because we focus on sort of quantitative, nationally available data. Um, so we look at things like disciplinary and attendance climate. Uh, third, we know that teachers matter. I think we don't always know how they matter, but we know they matter. So um, the specific traits are debated and we examine a couple. So we examine student-teacher ratio, student certification, experience, and salary. Um, fourth, we look at per-pupil expenditures, so sort of how much school funding matters uh, or how, much, how unequal school funding is across schools serving high- and low-income neighborhoods. And then finally, we look at um, the achievement and uh, achievement growth in schools serving high- and low-income neighborhoods. So I'll discuss how we measured each of these um, shortly. Uh, and again, our investigation was sort of limited by kind of readily available quantitative data, so we're definitely not capturing kind of more process or interaction um, driven school characteristics. And let me also be clear that these are not necessarily objective measures of school quality, especially the composition thing. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, there's little agreement on sort of how we should be measuring any sort of school quality anyway. So instead, we're just trying to present sort of the social context and the resource context present in schools that are serving high and low income neighborhoods. Okay, so our goal uh, is to describe the schools serving high and low income neighborhoods. So our first task is we have to figure out and we have to link um, neighborhoods to the schools that serve them. So in the United States, in most school districts, where a student lives either determines or at least influences in some way where they go to school. Um, even with the advent of school choice and charter schools and magnet schools and things like that, neighborhoods typically have a kind of default local school, either administratively or just in the choice set of parents. Many parents at least check out the neighborhood school and prefer to keep their kid close, right? So um, I can talk about some of the challenges of thinking about kind of open enrollment and those things given this data set. Um, but we're thinking about sort of the local neighborhood as the zoned, the school that's zoned to that neighborhood because it represents what's available. You know, if you weren't exercising any sort of choice options, like this is where your kid uh, would end up going. So we're documenting sort of the available resources to people in higher low income areas. So we're defining neighborhoods as census tracts, and then to link schools and tracts, use a crosswalk that Jen created between um, school attendance boundaries and tracts. So Jen started with the school attendance boundary survey data, SABS, uh, and this provides sort of shape files, polygons, of school attendance zones in the United States in 2013 and 14. And then using geospatial techniques, she took this extremely messy, crazy, giant, insane data set uh, and made a very nice, neat crosswalk for us to work with that links census geographies to the school attendance zones. So just to show you what I'm talking about here, so this is um, a map of the school attendance zone of my neighborhood in downtown LA. Uh, so the blue boundaries are uh, denoting school attendance zones for elementary schools. And this kind of, I don't know how you, if you can see this, but this one that I've kind of darkened the, uh, uh, darkened the boundary of, that happens to be the one around my apartment. Um, which is irrelevant to me because I don't send children there, but just as, a, as an illustrative point. Um, and then these black polygons are census tracts, right? So sometimes you have tracts like these ones that are completely within school attendance boundaries, so that's very easy to know what school is serving that neighborhood. But oftentimes you have you know, tracts like this that kind of span uh, across different school attendance zones. Um, so Jen used blocks, which are sort of this very tiny level of census geography and are generally not split by school attendance zones, 
uh, and was able to sort of create a crosswalk that linked every tract in the United States to the school or schools, in the case of a tract like this, that are serving it. Uh, and we sort of created weights based on the um, uh, proportion of the population uh, in each school attendance zone, um, sort of serving each part of the tract. So, uh, we can make Jen tell us more technical details later, but this is sort of what we did. So all that to say, we ultimately end up, for every tract, for every neighborhood in the United States, we sort of know, you know what proportion of that tract is in each school attendance zone. Each school attendance zone is linked to a school. Um, and then we, I'll tell you where we get information about the schools. So we're focusing on elementary schools. Our crosswalk is for schools serving fourth grade. And we're focusing on non-charter, non-magnet, sort of you know, local public schools. Um, the SABS data set is not, uh, doesn't cover the whole United States. Um, about 17% of tracks, I think, were not linked uh, in 2013-14. So we're presenting results for sort of all the data we have, uh, which includes at least one tract in almost all of our metropolitan areas in the United States. And on average, about 84% of tracts are covered in each metro. So again, you know, for every tract, we know something about the school or schools that serve it. Uh, so for a tract like this, its neighborhood characteristics are going to come both from you know, this school and from the school over here. And sort of we weight that according to the population proportion served by each place. OK, so then we identify, we have to identify sort of high and low socioeconomic status neighborhoods. Uh, so we end up using just the median household income in the tract. We tried poverty rate. We did a sort of more complex neighborhood disadvantage score. It all basically comes out the same. So um, for sort of ease of interpretation and links to later analysis for income segregation, we just look at the median household income in every neighborhood. And then we look at their larger metropolitan area and just cut the neighborhoods into quintiles. So we kind of have higher and lower SES neighborhoods in each place. So then after, so I'm going to go through and sort of show you what the schools look like in sort of higher or lower income neighborhoods. And then we look to see if income segregation between tracts sort of exacerbates the inequalities that I'm about to show you. Um, so when metropolitan areas are sort of highly segregated, our highest income tracts are like really homogeneously high income. And our low, uh, lowest income tracts are sort of really homogeneously low income. And we might expect you know, any sort of uh, decision making or resource allocation to be sort of more unequal between these neighborhoods. So if we think there is some link between neighborhood income and what the schools look like, schools are going to be sort of even more unequal in more segregated places. So we measure income segregation using something called the rank order information theory index, which tells us sort of how evenly sorted across neighborhoods families of different incomes are. And we simply classify metropolitan areas sort of then by their level of segregation. So we'll just kind of think about, I'm going to show you results for sort of the highest and the lowest segregated metro. So you don't have to worry about the details. If you are worried and interested in the details of measuring income segregation, uh, I'll do a plug for a recent paper I wrote with Sean Reardon, Kendra Bischoff, and Joe Townsend that just came out in demography that walks through a method for estimating segregation and how to deal with potential bias. And most importantly, it comes with a very easy Stata package that you can just use, and your life will be very easy. For the measures of income segregation, we use every tract. So we, don't, we aren't limited by the what's in the SAB or not. We sort of just ignore that and just get a metropolitan area measure of segregation. But yeah, the bias that we're talking about in that paper deals with, because all these data are based on samples, that could bias some, some things, and we kind of deal with that. So I apply our great method here, and we have no worries, and everything's, everything's perfect. Um, OK, so we know what schools serve each neighborhood. We've classified schools by neighborhood income. And now we need to measure what the schools look like. So we draw on three different data sets, the Common Core of Data, the Office of Civil Rights data and the EdFacts data, all in 2013-14. So here are those sort of five uh, big classes of neighborhood characteristics I mentioned earlier. So we're measuring school composition by examining uh, the racial, ethnic, free or reduced price lunch, uh, limited English proficiency, or gifted and talented education students in each school. The eligibility for free and reduced price lunch, free or reduced price lunch, is that your family income is below 185% of the poverty line. Uh, it's not a great measure, but it's the best we have for uh, economic characteristics of students. For sort of school climate, we're, again, you know, we don't have sort of more maybe qualitative measures of uh, interaction style or leadership or things like that. 
So we look at some characteristics that might you know, lead to things like uh, classroom disruption or um, sort of mobility and things like that. So we look at rates of chronic absenteeism, which is students absent 15 days or more, um, rates of suspension and grade retention. For teacher characteristics, we have the student-teacher ratio. We have rates of certification just in terms of being certified by the state. Unfortunately, the OCR doesn't provide information on like, do you have a master's degree or if you have a you know, subject specialization. So we're kind of limited to that. Um, and then we do uh, the rate of teachers in a school that are first or second year teachers, because sort of teacher experience seems to matter a lot for sort of kids' success. And then we look at teacher salary, which might tell us um, what sort of teachers we can attract to our, our school. Uh, school funding is per pupil expenditures on instruction, support services, and other instructional uh, resources. Um, and then we look at some uh, test score data from EdFacts. So for achievement, we're just looking at the rates of fourth graders that are proficient on their state's math and reading assessments. Rather than just using that proficiency rate, we rank schools within a state sort of, in, and assign them all to a percentile to account for every state having a different test and every state having a different definition of proficiency. Um, in addition to just the proficiency level, we do a really crude kind of growth measure. We don't have individual level test scores here. Um, so we simply just sort of look to see what fourth graders looked like in 2013-14 and what they looked like four years ahead of, uh, before that. Um, just to kind of, you know, we can't distinguish between something great or not so great that the school is doing if that has changed or just it could be a demographic change. Uh, it's just the best we do, we can do. And we do this just because we know that if, uh, achievement levels have a lot to do with things happening sort of outside the home and what kids come into school with. So we're just trying to sort of nod to that, um, to sort of knowing that proficiency is not necessarily telling us anything about what the school is doing. Okay, we're almost there. We're almost at results. So uh, the analyses for the paper are really simple, right? So for each neighborhood, we know characteristics about the school that school or schools serving it. Um, I think the median tract is served by two schools. Uh, and again, we sort of take this weighted average to sort of come up with the sort of school uh, resources available for a neighborhood. We end up with this tract level data set with characteristics of its regular non-charter, non-magnet schools. And then we're simply just going to report descriptively on the school characteristics by neighborhood income quintile. So that's what I'm going to show you now. OK, so first, looking at school racial composition. So these box plots present the distribution of school racial composition um, for the four largest groups in most places, um, uh, white students, Hispanic students, uh, African American students, and Asian students. So there's five sets of bars uh, across the x-axis, and those refer to neighborhood income quintile. So we have sort of our lowest income neighborhoods here, our highest income neighborhoods over here. Um, the boxes themselves, I, I, rather than just showing average, I kind of wanted everyone to get a sense of variability um, because you know, the average characteristic of a low-income school might, you know, it's going to vary because this is representing many, many uh, neighborhoods. So the boxes go from the 25th to the 75th percentile with the median uh, marked by a horizontal line, and then the whiskers kind of go from the 10th to the 90th. So you just have, have kind of sense of the distribution. So what we can take away from... Uh, this graph is first, you know, students, uh, or sorry, uh, neighborhoods, schools in the lowest income neighborhoods serve many fewer, you know, white and Asian students compared to high income neighborhood schools over here. So, you know, 75% of schools in the highest income quintile are served by, if we sort of look at the racial composition proportion here, these are sort of all majority white schools. So, you know, three quarters of uh, high income neighborhoods are sort of served by uh, majority white schools, and you have kind of the opposite story um, for low-income neighborhoods with larger proportions of Hispanic and African-American students. And again, this isn't telling us anything um, about school quality, but we know that racial inequality and structural racism exists throughout our society. And so if we think that there you know, are different levels of resources and attention given to schools serving different types of students, this is sort of magnifying and, and highlighting uh, inequalities across neighborhoods um, of different income levels. Moving to uh, other compositional measures, this tells us uh, the same setup with sort of five neighborhood income quintiles across the x-axis. The gray box is telling us about our free and reduced price lunch composition. The sort of gold-ish box is telling us about uh, limited English proficiency rate. And then the green box is telling us about uh, the gifted and talented rate. 
Um, and so we see kind of similar inequalities here, right? So we're, you know, we're, all my pictures are going to look like mountains, right? We sort of see this gradient down from the lowest to the highest income neighborhoods. So you know, it's not surprising that schools serving the lowest income neighborhoods have really high free and reduced price lunch rates. Um, but I think just, this just magnifies the difference. So the average uh, free and reduced price lunch rate in schools serving low income neighborhoods is 78% compared to 30% for high income neighborhoods. About nationally, about half of public school kids are eligible for free and reduced pr price lunch for reference. And we sort of see these similar, you know, kind of downhill, uh, downhill slope for limited English proficiency. So um, school, low income neighborhood schools are serving many more ling limited English proficiency schools compared to high income neighborhoods. There's not a whole lot of action with the gifted and talented. I think you know we, we don't take gifted and talented as any necessarily measure of actual ability. It, it's a lot about you know parents making phone calls to get their precious darlings in, right? But we do see you know I think I'm sure my mom did that for me. But um, we see you know higher rates uh, in sort of our higher income schools. So again, it's not you know surprising that economically disadvantaged neighborhoods serve. Uh, student bodies that are also uh, economically disadvantaged. But if we think that this sort of matters um, for children's outcomes, which past research has shown, uh, then it's, you know, it's potentially troubling. It kind of highlights um, unequal access to educational opportunities in high and low income neighborhoods. Um, you know, attending school with many disadvantaged peers can potentially exacerbate the different challenges that students might be facing at home uh, and in their neighborhood. So moving on to um, uh, climate and teacher traits, again, we kind of see these gradients where uh, high income neighborhood schools are more uh, advantaged, have more resources than low income neighborhood schools. Um, student teacher ratios aren't shown here because they were actually almost identical uh, across neighborhoods. So one, one piece of uh, equality news, I guess, but we'll talk about it, if that actually means equality when we get to funding. Uh, the left side of the picture shows the results for the discipline and attendance features. Uh, the gray bars are showing us the percent of students that are chronically absent. The green bars are showing us the percent of students that have had a suspension. And then the sort of darker green bars are showing us retention. And remember, this is for fourth graders. So in, the, in neighborhoods uh, serving low, in, sorry, in schools serving low income neighborhoods, you know, 5% of fourth graders are getting suspended. I, you know, I haven't been around a lot of fourth graders, but, um, you know, they're not that bad. I don't know. Um, so it's, it's potentially tr troubling, right? We sort of see um, higher rates of chronic absenteeism, higher rates of suspension, higher rates of grade retention across, um, across neighborhoods. And so our data can't distinguish between differences in student behavior, except, you know, uh, I guess chronic absenteeism reflects student behavior, although, of course, we don't know why those absences are occurring and what other family and neighborhood factors are playing in there. Um, we can't, you know, we don't know whether students are behaving differently in schools serving different neighborhoods or whether they're being treated differently. Um, and we do have um, literature, you know, demonstrating the sort of racialized disciplinary practices where socially disadvantaged students um, tend to be sort of disciplined more harshly than other students. So we can't distinguish that here, but again, sort of these spatial inequalities across neighborhoods of different income levels. Over here, the sort of light gray bars are showing us the percent of teachers that are not certified by the state. So thankfully, this is low in sort of um, all neighborhoods. But again, we still see that little downward slope where uh, we see sort of higher rates of non-certified teachers um, in schools serving the lowest income neighborhoods. The taller bars, the dark gray bars, are showing us the proportion of teachers in, the, in school that are in their first or second year measuring teacher experience. Um, and here we see that schools serving low income neighborhoods do tend to have less experienced teachers. Um, and we know that teacher experience uh, can translate to um, better student gains. OK, so a new shape. Uh, less, less mountain-like, but this is sort of moving to our monetary res resources. So on the left is showing average teacher salary, and this is adjusted for differences in cost of living across, um, across different places. Uh, we see a little bit of an in a level of inequality here. So teachers in schools serving the highest income neighborhoods tend to make about $3,500 more, which is about 6%, than teachers in schools serving the lowest income neighborhood. If we adjust this for the fact that levels of teacher experience are different in these places, that inequality shrinks a little bit, but it's still there. Um, and then the right figure is presenting per pupil expenditures in schools by the neighborhood income quintile that they serve. So across all neighborhoods, and again, this is adjusted for sort of cost of living uh, differences by something called the Educational Com 
comparative wage index, I can't think of what that C stands for, um, schools across all neighborhood income quintiles are spending approximately $10,500 per pupil. Um, this bar is actually a little taller, right? So um, the lowest income neighborhoods, schools in those places are, are spending about $350 more than schools serving the highest income neighborhoods. So this kind of similarity across um, schools of different income levels is a sign that school finance reform, uh, and which is intended to address you know, disparities in property taxes and other things between high and low income neighborhoods, is potentially you know, somewhat effective. Um, but edu uh, education economists have estimated that you know, um, uh, educating, successfully educating a low income child costs more money than successfully educating a higher income child, especially a low income child uh, growing up in a low-income neighborhood where 78% of their peers on average in their school are also low-income. So this doesn't necessarily tell us that this is sort of sufficient funding, right? You know, just sort of this broad level of equality isn't necessarily telling us we're going to have any sort of equitable outcomes. Instead, we might want to see something much more progressive where our sort of lowest-income neighborhoods are getting way more uh, expenditures per pupil. Um, and then finally, achievement. Um, so uh, these are the results for math. There's similar results for reading. The gray bars are sort of showing you just that kind of achievement level. And again, the y-axis is sort of percentiles within a state. It's not just the flat proficiency rate to try to account for state differences. And then the green bar is showing us that kind of four-year growth period at the school level, which again does not account for sort of individual level stuff, but it's the best we, we can do. So we see. Um, you know, sort of lower levels of uh, the schools serving low-income neighborhoods are sort of ranked lower in their state than the schools serving high-income neighborhoods. Uh, the difference in ranking is, uh, on average, schools serving low-income neighborhoods are at about the 33rd percentile in their state, uh, and the schools serving high-income neighborhoods are about the 70th. Um, and then if you look at the green bars, you see a less extreme gradient, which is pretty typical for studies that are looking at sort of levels versus growth. Um, you always see sort of more inequality in levels because as I said, a lot of that is just based on sort of student body composition and what children come in with. Um, and so we see sort of less inequality there, but still, and also sort of a wider spread in many cases. Um, but there is still a little bit of a gradient. Okay, so then the next thing we wanted to do was to see whether um, segregation exacerbates these inequalities. So I'm just going to highlight a few uh, findings here, the free and reduced price lunch rate, teacher salary and expenditures, and achievement. And again, the idea here is that um, if you're in sort of the lowest quintile, uh, lowest income quintile neighborhood, in a fairly integrated place, you know, your neighborhood is going to be sort of more mixed or middle income than it's going to be in a very segregated place where it's going to be sort of predominantly uh, low income and lower income. So we might, and same thing, sort of conversely with the high income neighborhoods. So we might expect some of those mountains to be steeper in the sort of most segregated compared to the least segregated metropolitan areas. And that is, in fact, what we see. So this is comparing sort of the same, you know, five, we're used to our sort of five quintiles of neighborhoods. And here I just have two versions of it. This is for sort of the most integrated places, metropolitan areas, metropolitan, metropolitan areas in the lowest quintile of segregation. And then this is in sort of the most segregated places. Um, and so, you know, just looking at it, you can see that the free and reduced price lunch composition definitely still is unequal here, but, you know, the gaps aren't huge. It's, you know maybe 42 to 68%, I don't have that quite written down here. Whereas here, it's super steep. So um, the sort of most, uh, the lowest income neighborhoods in the most segregated places have uh, free and reduced price lunches of, uh, free and reduced price lunch rates of 84% uh, compared to only, I think, 27 uh, down in the highest income neighborhoods. So we sort of see that how segregation exacerbates these inequalities. And also important to note here that it's, um, inequality is never, uh, or I think we often need to pay more attention to what's going on at the top when we talk about inequality at the top of the income distribution. It isn't just a story about disadvantage. You know, if you kind of drew a line here, the sort of outlier would be uh, the high income neighborhoods, right? So a lot of this is about how high income neighborhoods are sort of hoarding resources and creating really exclusive, really advantaged um, enclaves, uh, which is important when we think about policy solutions and sort of you know, what people are and aren't willing to kind of um, 
uh, do and, and give up in terms for the for the sake of equality. You know, these are the lowest inc these are in the lowest quintile for their metro. Um, but in more integrated metros, those places are probably going to have slightly higher incomes, or at least at least be more mixed income than in the really segregated places. So it's not necessarily the same average per se. That would just depend on the metro. But the idea is that in the more segregated metropolitan areas, when you cut neighborhoods into five groups, you know they're going to look a lot more polarized than if you cut neighborhoods into five groups in more integrated places. So then moving to teacher salary and per pupil expenditures, we have that same setup of sort of the most integrated metros, the most segregated metros, and then sort of what the different quintiles of neighborhoods look like. And so they don't look all that different from each other, right? These, you know, there's sort of maybe a little bit more compensatory spending here uh, in the most segregated places. So there's not a huge drastic um, level of uh, inequality here. Um, but again, you know, if we think that, um, you know, educating uh, children in sort of neighborhoods and schools of concentrated poverty is going to require more resources than educating kids in really affluent enclaves, right? We would want these, especially in the most segregated areas, we would want sort of much more compensatory, well, I would want, I don't know what you want, but I would want sort of much more uh, sort of compensatory spending uh, in those places. And you could also imagine, you know, incentives for very highly qualified teachers and things like that. Some of that's going to come through salary uh, as well. There's some evidence that when you pay teachers more, they do produce um, maybe better outcomes. So again, you know, at first glance, it's like, well, maybe this isn't a terrible news story because the bars all look pretty much the same. But when we think about the different levels of inequality across these places, we, we may not want them to look the same. We may want them to sort of uh, reflect more progressive uh, policies. And then finally, here are the achievement gaps. So here, the light gray uh, is the math. The dark gray is um, the reading. Uh, and again, we see sort of this you know, steeper gradient in the more segregated places in terms of both uh, achievement um, and our um, growth measures. So um, again, we just sort of see. And also, I should also say that, again, the gradient is a little bit flatter in the growth measures and the achievement measures, just like before. OK, so we've thrown a bunch of stuff at you. But I think, overall, what we're trying to do with this paper is uh, to demonstrate the level of inequality between neighborhoods and the types of schools uh, available to them. So as measured by composition, climate, teacher characteristics, expenditures, and achievement and growth, you know, in almost sort of uh, all of these factors, you know, we see inequalities between schools serving high and low income neighborhoods. And many of these inequalities are exacerbated by income segregation between neighborhoods. As I was just talking about, one area where there's perhaps less inequality than often thought is the financial resources. But again, for sort of equality of outcomes, we might hope not for sort of equity there, but for very progressively distributed resources. And unfortunately, that's not where policy is moving. So in the past couple decades, our school finance reforms have really sort of focused on providing um, adequ adequacy rather than sort of aiming for equity. So trying to provide sort of an adequate level uh, of spending for uh, districts serving the lowest income students rather than trying to think about what would that district need to sort of be equal to very, very high income districts. Um, so unfortunately, with our current um, policy priorities, it's not necessarily where we're headed. So in this paper, we really just kind of set out to provide this portrait of the link between uh, neighborhood income and school resources, which is, again, this kind of potential mechanism for why neighborhoods matter for kids. So just to kind of tie it back to our ongoing conversations about social innovation and pathways to opportunity, the social problem of sort of inequality in school contexts uh, is a problem of unequal access to opportunity, right? And this is one of those entrenched, you know, intractable social problems uh, that seems like it desperately needs some social innovation. Um, and you know, reducing these units, these are sort of the, I think, you know, things we try, we've often thought about. You know, how can we promote neighborhood integration? How can we promote um, school uh, integration, especially, uh, or along both sort of racial, ethnic, and economic lines. Um, how do we, you know, sort of in the meantime, or as a complement to, how do we promote sort of comp compensatory or progressive school resources for schools serving more disadvantaged populations? And these are problems that have obviously vexed policymakers um, for a long time, and thinking about how to get buy-in from all of the sort of constituents 
of, uh, of this inequality. Um, so it seems like social innovation could be critical here in facilitating partnerships with local stakeholders. I think the solution is probably going to look different in almost every district and city in the United States. What works in one place might not work in another. Um, so just to highlight a, you know, a few things that are going on, I've been involved in helping the National Housing Trust evaluate a pilot program where they're purposely putting low-income housing in more high-quality school districts to try to provide opportunity for uh, families to access these opportunities. There's also emergent partnerships around the country of sort of local districts that are neighboring, partnering with one another to try to facilitate transfers across district lines, because often the district is sort of the place where the most inequality is kind of taking place. Um, but these are all really challenging. And in response to any time you move someone or you reassign them to a school, you know, that sort of sets off a chain reaction where uh, inequality is often just sort of reproduced later on. Um, so today I focused on identifying, you know, the challenges in these pathways to opportunity. Uh, and now our task, you know, such an easy task I set out for us, now our task is to think about how the social innovation framework could be helpful in shedding new light uh, on unequal access to opportunity. Thank you.